E.T. the Extraterrestrial has been in our lives for nearly 40 years as of this video. If you had already developed memory retention by the 80s or early 2000s, chances are it's impossible for you to not know who E.T. is. Heck, even if you're incredibly young and haven't lived through an E.T. marketing frenzy, there's still a chance you know who the funky little alien is. E.T. the Extraterrestrial to this day is still highly regarded as an important and fantastic piece of cinema. But there's a pretty dang popular theme park ride based on him, he's been popping up in a lot of children's books lately, and tons of E.T. merchandise has been released over the years. And, well, even if E.T. isn't heavily marketed or relevant at this moment in time, he isn't forgotten. And, assuming things continue the way they are now, he probably won't ever be forgotten despite being a character from a one-and-done movie. Even outside of nostalgia pandering, he probably isn't going anywhere. E.T. is still extremely marketable. He might not be hip and trendy with kids right now, but you could probably drag him out and cash in on his timeless appeal pretty easily. Whether that be with just more merchandise targeting nostalgia, or finally caving in and starting the E.T. cinematic galaxy. E.T.'s timeless appeal and nature naturally lend themselves well to tons, and I mean tons, TONS of merchandising. Not too different from the effect Pokemon had on the late 90s, E.T. was all the rage during the 80s. Something I like to refer to as E.T. mania. E.T. was in endless commercials, had tons of toys, food product tie-ins, appeared on magazine covers, and was just all around a huge marketing frenzy. It would only make sense to cash in on the massive success of the movie with an official video game. And what a better time to release it than Christmas. If you're some sort of E.T. aficionado and or if you really like video games, you've most likely heard stories about E.T. the Extraterrestrial for the Atari 2600. It's been somewhat dramatically referred to as the death of video games during that era, as if it single-handedly destroyed Atari and led to a complete halt of video games until Nintendo popped up years later. If this is true, then why and how did E.T. get over 10 more video games? How did a single film with only so much material to pull from lead to this character having a long list of official video games? If this character really murdered the industry in cold blood, then it wouldn't make sense to keep rewarding him with more titles now, would it? E.T.'s video game history is surprisingly long. And, well, the mess just didn't end with Atari. Let's look at all the E.T. video games, including a handful of cancelled ones that never got to release. Alright, as stated in the opening of the video, a lot of people are aware that E.T. for the Atari 2600 is supposedly this huge monstrosity of a game. Due to its loaded history and the fact it's the first E.T. video game, this will probably be the longest segment. This game was so infamous that it inspired an urban legend and received a documentary. So buckle up. E.T. for the Atari 2600 drops you in a small game world where you control E.T. as you search for randomly placed pieces to help E.T. phone home and leave the Earth. E.T. has energy that gets used up as you perform various actions, but you can keep them rolling by collecting delicious and healthy Reese's Pieces. There's various different locations based on the movie, and they have enemies such as FBI agents who will take away your items or a scientist who carries you away. It's a rather frustrating game, and one thing a lot of players experience is falling into pits and what you have to levitate out. It's easy to fall into them, and getting out, while easy, just feels like a kick in the gut. Now, is it a bad game? It's... it's... it's a video game. It's honestly not even too bad. It isn't great, but if you go searching for worse games on the Atari 2600, you can easily find worse stuff. There is actually a lot of neat aspects about this game. For its time, it offers some really robust difficulty settings, like being able to adjust the amount of enemies and the speed at which they move. It also houses the first ever company-approved easter egg in a video game. While previous video games had already made use of easter eggs, such as Yar's Revenge, they were mainly snuck in by developers without seeking any approval. Whereas the easter eggs in E.T. were fully approved. The easter egg in question allows you to find Yar from Yar's Revenge, and Indiana Jones from another Atari game. Make no mistake, this game was an innovation for its time. It was one of the earliest games to have multiple locations, whereas many other Atari games at the same time would house the entire game in one location. In E.T., you have multiple areas that wrap around a cube-like shape, and it's one of the earliest games to have a definitive ending. You can keep playing and increasing your score, but there's still an actual dynamic ending scene present. The game officially entered development sometime in late July, 1982. 
Howard Scott Warshaw, a successful programmer who had many well-made Atari games under his belt, was commissioned to create the game. One of his titles included the previously mentioned game, Yar's Revenge, which was a smash hit and a very popular game that made Atari a ton of money. Now, here's the thing, Warshaw was only given five weeks to make E.T. The game had to be finished by September in order to be mass-produced and shipped off for the holiday season. This man somehow managed to make one of the most innovative games of its time, in like, a little over a month, whereas most other games would take at least half a year to make at this time. That's just nuts. That recontextualizes the entire game, and honestly makes it seem like a masterpiece compared to how people describe it. Warshaw has stated that if he had even just another week to work on the game, that some of its biggest issues would be resolved. And you know what? I fully, truthfully believe him. Again, I remind you that many people who were part of that industry at the time have stated that there were much worse games than E.T. So blaming this game and basically using it to undermine Warshaw's game development skills just feels kind of awful. Thankfully, Warshaw has had a pretty successful career since E.T., having written books, Hooray! I love books! Directed documentaries, Those are okay too. Becoming a psychotherapist, We always need those. There's probably some real good money in all that. Still, E.T. turned out bad. Not the developer's fault. He was given an unrealistic schedule and had to endure some pretty awful crunch. Plus, Steven Spielberg seemingly played the final game and gave it his blessing. I was, I was amazed at how difficult it was, and yet at the same time how much fun it was to play. Have you seen the latest update? I've seen the final game. Are you happy with it? Oh yeah, yeah, it's my favorite. Of course I'm biased, I made the movie. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> the final state of the game resulted in over half a million of its copies being returned, but it still sold somewhat well, at least for a normal company it would have, but not Atari, who for whatever reason made at least five million of them, which is about five times as much as games would sell around that time. The real issues that plagued Atari were self-inflicted cases of corporate mismanagement. Developers were enduring awful crunch, all sorts of bad games were being put out and taking up shelf space, way, way, way too many copies of games were being produced, and the all-around work culture at Atari just seemed pretty loose and dysfunctional. Honestly, the whole thing was a ticking time bomb, and the decay of the company was already starting to settle in place well before E.T. E.T. Atari was said to be the leading cause of the Atari video game burial. Allegedly, it was said to have millions of unsold copies buried. This turned out partially true, as back in 2014, the burial site was discovered, but E.T. was only a mere 10% of the games buried. That's still a pretty big percent, but it drives home the fact that Atari's mismanagement and overproduction of games in general was really what was at play. And it also proves that our little alien buddy wasn't the sole cause of the video game apocalypse. Ever since this discovery, people have started to actually kind of appreciate the game for what it is. So even if E.T.'s alleged murder on the gaming industry was a bit of an overblown statement, he was still a pretty dang controversial figure in gaming. The game was already considered kind of bad at the time, and it also saw many copies returned. For whatever reason, only a year later, another game featuring E.T. came out. Now, honestly, I really don't know how to explain this game. I'm not even sure if it's official. Apparently, a European game known as Aliens Return was released in 1983, but in a lot of regions it's named after and decked out with E.T. imagery, including this bootleggy looking cartridge with E.T. and his totally legitimate and memorable friends that everyone totally remembers from his hit movie. It was called Go Go Home Monster in one region, with E.T. replaced with a... a this, um, this thing kind of looks like a Sonic the Hedgehog and E.T. love child. I don't know what to make of this game, but it's a weird mixture of E.T. and a sort of Pac-Man-esque game. This is quite possibly, and honestly most likely, just a bootleg. E.T. bootlegs were already popping up at this time, and I don't plan on covering those, unless they seem like they could be real. If you're interested in E.T. bootlegs, there's a pretty great article discussing E.T. games, including bootlegs, that I'll link in the description, which you should totally check out. Whether or not Aliens Return was actually an officially licensed E.T. product or not, 1983 still saw a legitimate official E.T. video game, known as E.T. Phone Home. Phone Home was released on the Atari 8-bit family of computers in 1983. Yeesh, E.T. and Atari just keep trying to make this work, but they should really just break up. Thankfully, this game is actually a bit better than the regular E.T. game, 
It has the same basic concept, but now you're playing as Elliot instead of E.T., but still walking around aimlessly on a map trying to collect pieces. It's still a bit confusing, but it's got a lot more going on. I'm surprised Atari was allowed to go through with making this after how bad things turned out with the first game, and only a year after that. But hey, it's still a nice follow-up and improvement on the first game. Also, this game has some pretty freaky stuff in it. I was not expecting to hear this while playing the game late at night. Attention passengers, there will be a loud noise. If you are startled by loud noises, you might want to turn your volume down. E.T. might be one of my favorite movies of all time, but as a kid, E.T. sure did scare the living heck out of me. And this voice clip brought back that feeling of E.T. fear I haven't felt in quite some time. 1983, you just cannot stop with E.T. The Texas Instruments TI-994A was a home computer released in late 1979 by Texas Instruments. Many E.T. titles were being planned for it, but very little of them seemed to release. There was apparently a contract signed between Steven Spielberg and Texas Instruments, and seven known E.T. titles to have been in development around 1983. The main game we know about, simply titled E.T. The Extraterrestrial, was a shameless Frogger clone featuring E.T., but honestly, it didn't look all that bad. It's a little hard to find it. In fact, it possibly didn't release at all. The following is an excerpt from the TI-99 4A video game house website. <clears throat> According to Patrick King, who programmed another E.T. game on the 994A while with Western Technologies. There may be a reason why E.T. the Extraterrestrial is so hard to find today or possibly never hit the market. According to him, <clears throat> When Steven Spielberg walked into a room in Northern California and saw our line of E.T. 994A games on monitors running alongside the Atari 2600 E.T. game, he went ballistic and ordered the plug pulled on the Texas Instruments license and their $3 million license fee refunded. We suspect this happened because we had used the full powers of the TI-9918 chip to make our games look really great, and the Atari 2600 game on the old Intel 6502 chip looked pretty sad by comparison. Common Sense told him that the line of the TI-99 4A games should not be looking better and more interesting than the market leader 2600 version. It's a bit shaky, but I'm willing to believe it. Thankfully, a fully complete and playable ROM of the game is available somewhere online, so it's been archived. But wait, what about all those other E.T. games that were being made for this thing? There's like six more of them. A series of E.T. games known as E.T. and his adventures at sea, E.T. and his adventures on land, and E.T. and his adventures in the air are known to have been in development by a team known as Looking Glass. Out of all three of these games, E.T. and his adventures at sea is the only one fully complete. And it has been made available online, but it's really hard to find a ROM. But it exists. There's also an eBay listing related to the game too, so I guess there's also that. The game is basically your usual Carmen San Diego style education game, where, for whatever reason, E.T. and Elliot are now crewmates and sail the world, running into dangerous obstacles and educational trivia questions. Despite the complete lack of anything to do with the movie, it's a cute game, and I can headcanon E.T. visiting Earth at some point and basically just being like, Dude, Elliot, let's go out to sea. I wish I could find a ROM, but I haven't looked hard enough, and I'm too shy to ask around for one. But I do plan on trying to play it someday, like I have most of these other E.T. games. There's not a whole lot of info on E.T. and his adventures on land or E.T. and his adventures in air, but we know they exist. I managed to encounter this document discussing all three games, where the other two games are mentioned. I haven't been able to find anything else though, and the document primarily talks about E.T. and his adventures on land. The game seems like it'd be adapting the movie. The educational goals of the game are apparently to help kids learn about plants and animals, as well as how humanity interacts with them. The gameplay seems to have various different minigames or styles of play, including a level where the player helps plants and animals, which in turn helps E.T. ship land are helping Elliot climb up a mountain path to make contact with E.T.'s ship, are maneuvering E.T. and Elliot through a desert landscape to get to E.T.'s ship. Remember E.T.'s ship. Only think of E.T.'s ship. E.T.'s ship is all that matters in life. E.T.'s ship. Our ship. The people's ship. We are E.T. This is our ship. Um, anyway, the document contains some neat files with what appears to be storyboards and concept art of the game world. Also a doodle that seems like it'd be cross-promoting E.T.'s other adventures in the air and at sea. 
All around, it seems like they had some pretty neat ideas here, with a pretty clear plan on what they wanted to do. In fact, I, I think there's even some code in this document itself. Maybe someone could do something with that. I really wish we could know more about adventures in the air, but it seems like it's a bit of a cryptid for now. Wait, so if there were seven whole games being made for the TI whatever, and we only know about four of them, what are the other three? It turns out that his adventure series might have had a fourth title. While scouring some websites, I found out that someone compiled what seems to be a prototype of a game called E.T. and his adventures on Earth. I figured that this was probably just a renamed version of Adventures on Land, but it doesn't really add up with the game document I found. This game is different, and honestly, it feels quite brutal to play, and it doesn't really feel educationally focused like the other three titles. It also seems it was made in 1985, which is strange given the story from earlier about Spielberg's strong reaction back in 1983. I tried to find more context for this game, which brought me to an Italian website with information on the game, which, via a rough Google translation, makes the game seem kind of grim. Here's what the site had to us say, albeit poorly translated. We will find ourselves in the situation of having to do our best to help E.T. the extraterrestrial inside a terrestrial laboratory where he is imprisoned, and save his life before he ends up like his friend. In the game screen, we will see, right at the beginning, a figure of a large alien-shaped creature in the lower center of the screen. When the fire button is pressed, this figure will disappear and we will see, however, all the rooms filled with something. Well, the creature we saw at the beginning of game has been broken down into the various rooms of the laboratory. So here is that E.T. will need our help to be able to reassemble his friend in the exact shape and position of where we had seen him just before. As you can imagine, doing so will be nothing but simple. All the walls of the laboratory are electrified. Just touch them, and E.T. will die instantly. You only have one life. Beyond the walls, there will be a sweet little dog that wanders in the upper floor of the laboratory. And that we will not have to approach. Each piece of the creature to be rebuilt, 16 pieces in all, is in a different locked room. And the game begins with E.T. having a key to open only one door. There is a room containing the keys to all the other rooms, so I would say E.T. start opening that one, so that he can take another key and be able to open another door. From now on, we will always have to return to get a key to open next door. The body part of creature present in the rooms can be taken simply by walking on it. E.T. will have to morbidly carry back one piece of his friend at a time. So once you have taken the piece, you will immediately go to place and leave it in position we want by pressing the fire button. In the meantime, E.T. go on business around the lab. He will get tired and need to eat and drink. When the time comes, we will notice because he will change color. When she is thirsty, she turn yellow, and when she hungry, she will become celestial. To make him feel better and before she dies, we can quench his thirst and feed him using the two rooms containing the food and water dispensers that have the color corresponding to that of E.T. at that moment. Once eaten and drunk, she will return to normal color and will have the energy needed to continue her mission. I too love the moment in E.T. where he and an alien buddy of his get kidnapped and morbidly disassembled in a deadly laboratory. That was such a formative moment of my childhood. I'm also happy to see E.T. confirmed as a gender fluid icon. That's always nice. Very ahead of its time in that regard. But yeah, as that blur mentioned, the walls are electrified. If you touch the walls in this game, you instantly die. It's needlessly brutal and gives the game this rough, unfinished feeling. Also, the fact that you can only unlock one door at the start of the game and if you don't open the door with the permanent key, your entire run is ruined and you have to start over. That just feels kind of arbitrary. There is some neat ideas, but compared to the other games being planned for the TI whatever, it's completely small potatoes, and it feels stressful to play. It's still super cool to see such an obscure thing compiled and released on the internet though. I really hope that somehow, despite the odds being so low, we get to find out about those last two E.T. games that were allegedly being made for this thing. Over two decades later, E.T. Digital Companion released for the Game Boy Color. This is a very strange title, basically a personal digital assistant, but on a Game Boy. You get asked a series of highly invasive questions when you first boot this game, which are framed in a creepy manner with the game specifically saying we need this or that. 
Honestly, I wouldn't feel comfortable answering any of these questions if this were a game release now in the age of video games and internet connectivity. This thing also features some boring minigames, an address book, a calendar, and so on. You can also interact with a Flopgopple virtual pet. For all those fake E.T. fans out there not in the know, a Flopgopple is a species in the E.T. extended mythos. Introduced in the novel E.T., The Book of the Green Planet, which is a sequel to the movie. It's a pretty hastily tossed together game and released in October 2001, about half a year before the 20th anniversary re-release of the movie. It's a rather blatant cash grab, and hardly even a game. It's worth noting that this is the first E.T. game released by New Kid Co. The first of a planned total of 10 new E.T. video games published by New Kid Co. Yeah, sometime in the early 2000s, two decades after E.T. allegedly killed the gaming industry, a company agreed to undertake the task of making 10 new unique E.T. titles. And now we'll get to see how that turned out for them. Our next game is E.T. Escape from Planet Earth, released on the Game Boy Color only one month after E.T. Digital Companion. It's actually a pretty good unique puzzle game. No joke! It feels lovingly made, and there's actually a lot to do in it. Unlike the other games that adapt the movie, it actually manages to adapt it in a somewhat charming fashion. You bike around as E.T. and Elliot and solve puzzle after puzzle, with each area having a certain handful of puzzles you need to solve before you can move on. The puzzles are rather simple and kid-friendly, but they still feel fun to solve. For whatever reason, they gave E.T. ice powers. Which is a pretty strange liberty, but it's pretty neat, I guess. All around, it's surprisingly a great game, but there's not a whole lot to say about it. Our next E.T. game is yet another game called E.T. the Extraterrestrial, this time for the Game Boy Advance. It was released in December 2001. That's right, three months in a row had their own E.T. video games. All of them for the Game Boy systems with similar box arts, no less. A couple years ago, I played through this entire game, and it's strange. It features multiple different types of gameplay spread across various levels. There's some poorly designed top-down mazes, auto-scrolling flying levels, a level where you have to assemble E.T.'s communication device in a specific, stressful order, and it all ultimately culminates in a final level that is literally just the gameplay of Lunar Landing. Or so I'm told. Some of the sprite work in the game is genuinely nice. And there's some decent ideas, but it's all around a pretty bad game. I wasted over half an hour lost in one of the levels within Elliot's neighborhood, which is a horrifically designed mess of a labyrinth. I genuinely hate this game. If you thought three E.T. games releasing within three months of the same year was bad, try four within the same week. March 2002 saw the release of four E.T. games at once, more or less on the same day. This is also basically less than half a year after the previous three games released, which means the seven whole E.T. games releasing within half a year. E.T. Interplanetary Mission is a PS1 and PC game. The PS1 version boasts box art with the same visual aesthetic as the Game Boy and Game Boy Advance games before it, while the PC one looks like this, which is kinda generic. Interplanetary Mission is a rather simple, isometric puzzle game featuring a startling 3D model of E.T. E.T. in this game drops his previous pacifist tendencies and can now attack his foes with a heartstone attack. Your main objective is to run around dead in hollow environments solving puzzles. Honestly, the game can be pretty brutal with enemies to the point of where they made me too annoyed to finish the game during both of my attempts at a playthrough over the past couple years. And apparently at the end of the game, you even get to visit Earth. Also, there's no music in this game. It's all just sound effects and ambience. It feels like a dead void full of nothing. I wondered if my PS1 copy was just jank, but after buying a PC copy and going through the pains of installing it, as well as watching gameplay videos of this game, I realized that this game was truthfully actually just shipped with no music, which for its time is pretty noticeable. I do like that the game at least isn't a direct movie adaption, and while the game isn't the best looker around, it's got some decent visual design. Part of me wants to return to it someday and finish it out of spite. Someday. Someday. The second game to release during the E.T. Crisis of 2002 was E.T. in the Cosmic Garden, which was released on the Game Boy Color, making it the third E.T. game to do so. Its box art makes use of the same charming aesthetic that the other handheld E.T. games and interplanetary mission used. It's a real-time game where you navigate the galaxy taking care of, collecting, and discovering all sorts of new plants. It's got a nice presentation and sprite work, though it can get a bit confusing to navigate at times. Also, as nice as the sprite work is, some of the layering is a bit off at times, as most characters seem to have a black border around them rather than being transparent. 
The gameplay loop is pretty simple, albeit a bit stressful at times, as your plants are always at a constant risk of being eaten by E.T.'s horrible friend, the malevolent giant space slug who he chooses to hang out with despite the fact he's constantly trying to ruin his space garden. The basic idea behind the game was neat, though it was too repetitive to justify playing to completion and I think I'm totally fine never coming back to this game. Now our next two games are fairly odd. They're both PC exclusives and very little footage of them exists online. Not only that, but it seems like they haven't been archived anywhere on the internet. These two games are E.T. Away From Home and E.T. Phone Home Adventure. I bought both games on PC along with the PC port of Interplanetary Mission. Away From Home and Phone Home Adventure are very similar games developed by the same developer, while Interplanetary Mission is completely different and was made by a different developer entirely. Both Away From Home and Phone Home Adventure are very short games, both having a handful of minigames. Their only major differences is that one of them is a point-and-click game, and the other is an incredibly strange, flimsy co-op party game. I had a rough time getting these to run on my PC since they're so, so old. The fact I was able to get them running at all honestly surprised me. But yeah, they ran horribly. The audio for both was distorted, and Away From Home just refused to display properly for me. I eventually kind of fixed that, but I still experienced a visual error in which cutscenes would not display properly. Thankfully, I could skip them. Both games are very generic games that make use of the same assets, with Phone Home Adventure prioritizing the character Michael, and Away From Home outright ignoring Michael in favor of Gertie. Mary, the mother of Elliot's family, narrates Away From Home extensively in an out-of-character fashion that's mildly unsettling. These games ran so badly on my PC that I absolutely could not finish either of them. Despite them being short and not very good games, I kind of wish they ran better for me. I would love to play more. I at least got some weird ironic enjoyment out of Away From Home's ridiculous E.T. dress-up game and would love to see what else is in store. It's a real shame that these two average games have next to no presence on the internet. All seven of the previously mentioned E.T. games were all from a publisher known as New Kid Co. They primarily went after the license of franchises that were either popular or marketable towards children. They tanked in 2005 due to a variety of financial issues. The company didn't really keep up with developer payments, falling extremely far behind in paying the various development teams working for them. In fact, it seems as if New Kid Co.'s unreliable nature resulted in some of the studios working for them having to shut down too, which is pretty awful and irresponsible. Despite the fact that their last three E.T. games never came to be, we do know bits and pieces about them. E.T. Return to the Green Planet was going to be a console game for the PS2, and it had four of its music tracks uploaded to YouTube by composer Dean Evans. These tracks were created with various orchestral sample libraries and sound like they are taken right out of the movie's distinctive soundtrack. Seriously, they're great! The box art of the game also has a Microtech and Flopgopple on it, as well as Botanicus, E.T.'s mentor-like figure from the Green Planet novel. The game was said to be a point-and-click game where your goal was to assemble a ship made of organic materials to visit Elliot. E.T. and the Search for Dragora was going to be another gardening simulation game with adventure elements, like Cosmic Garden, intended to be released on GameCube and other consoles. You can see the space slug and B from Cosmic Garden on the box art, which suggests to me that it was likely intended to be a full-on companion game of some sort. It's the only one of New Kid Coast's three cancelled E.T. games to have any screenshots available. Despite the small amount of info in the game, we know that it was completed according to people involved in the game's development. Man, it's kinda sad that this one hasn't surfaced on the internet at all, despite that. E.T. Solarian Project had the least amount of info available out of all three of these games. All we have is its box art, but only in an extremely pixelated and blurry form. It's really hard to gather anything from this. I can hardly even speculate what it might be about. It sounds like it probably would have been pretty out there in terms of plot compared to the other two based on the name. Apparently developers who worked on this game have barely any recollection of it other than its cancellation. It's a shame that these games never got to release, as it seems like they probably had the most going on out of all the E.T. games. Apparently source code still exists for the two console games, but many assets have been lost to time. Therefore, these games are all lost media, and sadly, they will likely stay as such. After the incident back in 2002, no more E.T. games were made for another decade. In fact, you could even say that no legitimate E.T. video games have been made since then, because the closest thing we've gotten to such a thing was E.T. The Green Planet, a 2012 farming simulator released exclusively on iOS. 30th anniversary merchandise for E.T. advertised the game, mostly via pamphlets and DVDs and Blu-ray cases, but other than that it had next to no fanfare. 
The Green Planet went all in on referencing the E.T. sequel novel that the app itself is named after, and even retooled and redesigned some of the characters from it. The game is currently no longer available anywhere, and I have no idea when it was pulled. It seems to basically be lost media, like pretty much every other game made for smartphones that require an internet connection are destined to someday be. Part of me misses my little E.T. garden, but I swore off Apple's phones over half a decade ago, so even if it was still around, I wouldn't even bother playing it. It's a bit of a bummer, but not a big loss. My memories are a bit hazy, but I remember it being incredibly stingy. Like most farming simulators, a majority of the game was just sitting around and waiting for timers to finish ticking down. Timers that were specifically designed to get you to shell out money on the game to speed things up. Like a lot of E.T. games, Flowers and Botany was a huge element and over time you could acquire pieces of a communicator which E.T. planned to use to talk to Elliot. I never got those communicator pieces because, well, to be frank, I was never going to spend money on such an app in the first place, no matter how much it targeted my nostalgia. Actually, you know what? I wonder if literally anyone has ever managed to fully assemble that thing. I wouldn't be surprised if nobody ever got to see what happens after restoring the communicator. I guess it'll just have to remain one of the greatest mysteries in the E.T. lore iceberg. If E.T. having an ungodly amount of his own games was not strange enough, he's appeared in multiple other games thanks to collaborations and cameos. Back in 2001, a GameCube game release known as Universal Studios Theme Park's Adventure. It was a pretty rough game where you aimlessly wander around a virtual Universal Studios, partaking in various attractions. As a kid, I actually somewhat enjoyed this game despite it not being good. I pretty much fully bought the game because I got it used from a blockbuster for like 5, and E.T. being front and center on the box art made me want it. Each attraction in this game is basically a little mini-game. They're all fairly simple and a bit generic, and the E.T. one involves the bike escape sequence from the end of the movie. Oddly, it just flat out has nothing to do with the actual E.T. ride at Universal. The biking mini-game is a linear, horizontal path the player has to bike down. The player is given a generous time limit, and at the end, the player gets to say a short farewell to E.T. You can also run into a meet-and-greet E.T. within the park area itself, in which you are rewarded for doing so. Honestly, this game can be so bad it's funny. Woody Woodpecker narrates a lot of the game, which gets annoying really fast. You can also perform free child labor by picking up litter and trash spread throughout the park. Which to me just seems as if the developers of this game are trying to warn us, the players, that the real life parks are just as dirty and have trash lying everywhere. LEGO Dimensions was a toy-to-life game that allowed you to purchase unique LEGO sets and play with them in-game. Out of all the toy-to-life games from this era, it's the only one that gives you actual toys and not just stiff and cheap plastic figures. That actually makes me kind of appreciate it compared to a lot of its competitors. Although, if I'm being honest, its gameplay could often feel a bit rough and clunky compared to other LEGO video games. Every franchise represented in the game had its own world to explore, and E.T. was no exception. The Little Alien was also the reason I bought an extensively discounted copy of this game. E.T.'s world is actually pretty dang neat and full of all sorts of references to the movie. Unfortunately, the game's dialogue could often get annoying, made worse by the fact that the game thinks it's extremely clever while being a little too smarmy. Although, honestly, a pair of glasses is all you really need. Just watch! Who's this? It's Superman! And this? Nope, no idea. <sighs> We should totally start an alien club! Yeah, now we're talking. Phone. E.T. Game. Good. Thankfully, there were still some cute and funny tidbits here and there spread throughout the game. And some of the small character interactions are pretty great. Say, didn't I pass your home planet on my way to Earth? E.T. Make friend. E.T. Phone. Homer. If I could go back in time and show young me that I can drive around in a Sonic the Hedgehog themed car as E.T. while exploring Springfield as E.T. says, Oh, got to go fast. Young me probably would have exploded. Really makes me wish that a game like this could have been possible over 20 years ago. Also, I just want to say it's a tragedy that this game died before Bill and Ted could become a thing in it. Oh well, can't complain. I still got my E.T. E.T.'s seemingly final video game appearance as of making this video was 2017's E.T. Pinball DLC for Pinball FX3. It's a pretty cute board that evokes imagery from the movie well enough. I bought and played it for a while, and I can tell it was made with a lot of love. I'll have to keep coming back to it to find all the hidden easter eggs and movie details. Well, there you have it. The really complicated, multi-decade history of E.T. in video games. Most people just know about the infamous Atari game, as well as how much people hate it but it gets much, 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 much more complicated beyond that. Hopefully one day we can get a deeper look into all the cancelled E.T. video games we lost along the way. 
Until that day, you should all check out some of the articles I've linked down below in the description. I refrained from talking about some of the ET bootlegs in this video, and I likely missed some details here and there on the actual games. So you should all definitely read Bad Game Hall of Fame's article which goes over this stuff. Also, don't forget to be good by subscribing. And also by sleuthing the internet to find any means of being able to play the cancelled games. Anyway, take care.